Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Membership Choice webinar. My name is Kero O'Shea, Membership Director for Rotary District 9465, and it's great to have you all with us tonight. Tonight's webinar will be on building a contemporary Rotary Club, lessons from Elizabeth Key, and will be presented by James McLeod from Rotary of Elizabeth Key. But it's now my very great pleasure to introduce uh, our panellist, James McLeod, to present tonight. James is a founder and current board member of Rotary of Elizabeth Key and past president of the Rotary Club of Crawley, assisting local and international charitable causes. He was named as a Rotary Paul Harris Fellow in 2014 and again in 2017 for his contribution to the development of Rotary communities. His love of dogs sees James devote time regularly to the dog's refuge home. So it's my very great pleasure to introduce James McLeod. Thank you, Caro, and uh, welcome and good evening to everyone uh, out there in Cyberland and also to our international um, visitors who are listening in. Hello to wherever you are tonight or, or during the day, in fact. So good morning, perhaps. Um, I think I wanted to start with just to uh, give you a bit of a background um, to how the Rotary of Elizabeth Key started. And I think a good starting point is actually to let you a little bit know about my Rotary story. So I was a Rotary Exchange student just after my, um, well, I finished high school in 2000. And so for the year of, in 2001, I, I went to a little town in the northwest of the US called Squim. And I stayed there and as, as a Rotary Exchange student, you integrate into the community and you integrate into a Rotary Club. And it was such a fantastic experience that I always knew one day that I would um, one day be a Rotarian and, and do what my fellow Rotarians were doing at that point. Um, I was quite surprised, however, when um, an opportunity came along when I was about 26 years old, so probably about a couple of decades earlier than I thought it would. Um, and the offer was to be a charter member of, at the time, a really contemporary uh, Rotary Club um, that was engaging with young people and um, had some really great plans to do that. Um, in my hometown of Perth. And, and that club started off in 2010. I was a charter member and pretty early on they, they lined up the succession so that I would be the, in fact, the president uh, nominee at the time. So three or four years down the track, um, I would be president. And I went to the Rotary thinking, well, really, this is going to be a good thing. I'm just emerging my career. I'm trying to broaden my contacts and uh, I joined the club. And lo and behold, one thing led to another, you integrate, you get involved, and all of a sudden, you know, you're on the board and then you're involved in you know, most aspects of the club. <clears throat> in 2013-14, um, I was the president of that club, and it was a bit of a, a turbulent uh, prior year. So the club was going through a bit of a rebuild. So it was a really interesting learning experience. So not only have I seen I guess the, the, emergen the emergence of a new club, um, I've also seen it try and uh, recover to, to where it was uh, previously when it first started. And um, after a couple of years, uh, post that year, I, I've, I really thought, well, what is my greatest um, impact that I can have through the Rotary Network? And I, I figured it would actually be uh, helping other Rotary clubs um, be stronger. And, I guess shortly after my year as president, I, I got tapped on the shoulder by um, the district governor who, who was aligned with my year, asking me to join a membership committee um, that was really trying to promote Rotary in Western Australia. And at the time, you know, I was studying and I was busy. I said, look, I want to, but just, just not now. And uh, like any good Rotarian, the tap on the shoulder kept happening. And then eventually in about mid-2015, I said, fine, I'll be involved. Um, what is it we're actually doing? And in the end, what, what happened is this committee was put together to um, start new Rotary Clubs in Perth. And, and throughout my travels, um, I visited other Rotary Clubs in India, in the US, and, and one that really stuck out in my mind was a club in San Francisco that engaged with you know, younger professionals, who were busy, um, time poor, had young families, and were based in the CBD. So I said to the former district governor, well, look, if I'm part of this committee, um, what I'm gonna do is 
um, I'll put everything into it and I'll help start up a new club, providing um, I think uh, a really good idea to start one would be in the CBD aimed at young professionals and we really do rotary just a little, uh, just tweaks on the existing model to make it really appeal to young professionals. And so that's what we did. And um, it all started off with shortlisting 10 people um, who, from my network uh, who, who bought into the idea of, of building something. And we grew it. We, we got the framework of what we wanted to, or what would appeal to us uh, in terms of meeting time, meeting venue, um, you know, the basics um, you know, of Rotary. And um, from there, we just, we started to grow. So initially it was a bit of a build phase in terms of trying to design the club. But what we actually um, did is we drew a line in the sand and we said, right, well, we can't just keep on meeting. So why don't we set a time to have a open day to the public and really welcome ourselves to the, the Perth community. So that's what we did. And um, in September 2016, we aimed for our open day and had 60 people through the door to learn about what we were doing um, through, the, through Rotary Elizabeth Key. And through that process, we actually had enough uh, people to charter. So we, we had around 30 people, but about 24 to 25 um, put their name on the charter list to be a part of our club. And it's been a fantastic journey so far and um, we are continuing to grow and we're now just over 30 members um, and we're learning lessons along the way, um, but we've got our systems and processes in a point now where um, they're doing, uh, in fact, the, the club's got a fantastic foundation from which to grow from. So today is really about um, sharing some of the lessons um, that we've found along the way, uh, but also um, how, I guess, where we've got our growth from and, and how we expect to continue to grow. So technically our first induction was in February this year. So we, we had an induction of uh, approximately 30 members. Um, and our aim is to grow to 100 members and then apply a membership cap. The idea around that is because uh, we want to make sure that we don't lose sight of, of the community and everyone gets to know each other and it just doesn't become bigger. I think if we get to 100, then we'd probably look at starting up another chapter um, somewhere else to, to replicate what we've done. And you can see by looking at this pie chart that most of our new members have um, come from word of mouth, so from existing members. And I think that's great because we know that um, people um, introduce people who are like themselves. So we're getting some really quality people through the door. Um, in the early days, we had, we had quite a lot of um, media coverage from local newspapers. And so a couple of people were, you know, the club was brought to the attention through them. Um, through Facebook, and we have had one uh, Rotary member who's come across from another club. Um, now, that, that's an interesting topic because we, we have a policy where we don't generally accept members um, from other clubs, um, so we don't cannibalise uh, their membership. However, if there's a really good reason and that member had already been in discussions with their membership team about their future at Rotary, then uh, I think it's much better for everybody for them to stay engaged with the Rotary Network and drop off altogether. Now, I think probably ongoing, word of mouth is going to be our, our greatest source of um, marketing and new business. Um, but there's been a couple of key standout um, lessons uh, in terms of uh, how to uh, get new people in the door. And I think ultimately it comes down to being, um, making an environment where people are, uh, feel comfortable to bring people along. Um, so what I call that being referable. Um, so creating the opportunity for members to refer other members, but also making sure that your club is um, referable so people feel proud to introduce people to your club. So we're going to explore that just a little bit. Um, but I think what, what a good starting point is actually to... Um, now, this isn't for everyone. I have to, I have to put that out there now. Um, this is what has worked for us. Um, I fully appreciate that um, other, club, other clubs around are doing fantastic work and they have a real style about them that is unique and, and I, don't think, I don't suggest disrupting that if it's working for them. 
But for our, uh, for our niche and for our age group, uh, what I would consider isn't referable is the, the singing, um, the fine sessions, the toasting, um, any mention of the Queen altogether, you know, uh, grace, uh, even having high cost meals really is a deterrent for, I guess, the 25 to 45 year old age group. And uh, I guess more importantly, though, not, not helping members uh, fulfill what we promised to them, which is to be a vehicle where they could make a change to the community. So then if we think about what's, uh, in fact, just before we get into what's referable, I, I just also wanted to show you this slide, which was um, a little bit of our statistics on um, how we've gone with social media. Social media is a really important aspect for our club, not only to, I guess, drive, um, you know, drive people to our club, but it's also great to keep our members engaged. So it's a communication mechanism for Facebook, in September 2016, 44 followers. By June 2017, that's grown to 372. Uh, but more importantly, our, our, our content views are, are now you know, almost four times as much, or three times as much. Um, and we've been able to do that with just the one social media coordinator. So uh, we've had some really great um, outcomes too. So at least you know, there's been posts which have had a few thousand views on it. At the start, we didn't have a website. In fact, we didn't have one until January this year. Uh, but now we've um, attracted about 18,000 different people to, to our website. Um, in fact, unique visitors um, and total visits being just under two and a half. And again, that's with one uh, webmaster. All of our meetings, or in fact, our major meetings, um, uh, and I think I'll go into that in a second, but our, our major meetings are um, promoted through a, a site called Eventbrite, which also does the ticketing um, for us and the registration process. And uh, early days, we, we had about half capacity, uh, but now we're sitting around the 91 capacity uh, in terms of how many people we can fit in the room. And then LinkedIn. Now, this is, this is a new strategy for us, but um, it's starting to produce um, some really good um, following and also um, outcomes from a marketing point of view. And um, when you measure LinkedIn success, it's, it's via impressions. <clears throat> so now we've, um, our first post generated about 2,000 impressions and our highest has been just under 8,000. So let's go back to the, the concept of being referable. And for our club, um, I think the structure was one thing that really stood out in the early discussion for, um, for, the, for the founding core group in terms of what they want to see in a club. And what we determined was that we would have four meetings a month. Um, however, it's the, the structure of those meetings, which I guess is the, the secret source. On the first week of the month, we have a really inspiring or high-profile high guest speaker. On the second and the fourth week of the month, we have what we call a projects meeting, which is essentially either breaking into groups and progressing different projects, or indeed uh, having a local charity come and talk about the work that they do. And the third meeting of the month is purely a social event. And that might be off-site or it might be um, just a casual drink at one of the local uh, bars in Perth. But our biggest strategy in terms of drawing people into the club and, and creating an environment where our members are proud to bring people along is to have some really awesome, high-profile, interesting guest speakers. Now, the, the, because it's once a month, we can really set the bar quite high in terms of who we've had. So we kicked off with a you know, former Young Australian of the Year, um, Akram Azimi, <clears throat> and we've had everything from politicians to former you know, uh, champion sports um, stars and founders of um, different establishments and CEOs. But I think the more exciting is who, who we've got coming up. So, um, you know, Professor Lynn Beasley, a, a former Australian of the Year, Sam Walsh, the former CEO of Rio Tinto and Warwick Helmsley, that's the next three months. So you can see that this is really the bedrock uh, to try and bring people to our, to our club. 
<clears throat> and the other thing that this does is um, it, for every uh, meeting, we probably get about 10 to 15 guests or at least maybe, maybe 20 to 25 guests come to the club. They may be uh, other Rotarians, um, but generally they're just people who are really interested to hear what uh, our club's about and also the speaker. So through Eventbrite, we've been able to build a database of, of supporters, and I think we're up to about 300 now. So these are people who aren't members, but who have had some interaction in the club. And by one, having um, high profile speakers, but also having a, a full room, you can really build your capacity. Now, for those people who are members of clubs where you say, well, I might only have 20 members in our club, um, and we might not be local to Perth, Perth City Centre. So how, how do we um, get people, you know, like a, a CEO of an institution uh, like Warwick Helmsley to our club? And I think the solution there is collaboration. So, you know, three Rotary clubs coming together once a month could easily fill 60 or 70 people in a room. And when you have that type of a atmosphere, there's a real buzz and it just creates momentum. I want to let you know about some of our projects that we've had now. And I think you can see by these images that <clears throat> they're really, I guess, um, they're, they're catchy, they're engaging graphics. And I think that's, try, that's what we try and do with our projects. So we want to think, think a little bit differently. There, there's certainly a place for uh, hands-on service activities. In fact, our club loves doing those. Um, but we also have different events where we try and really leverage our skills to create an impact. The first one that, the first project we've, we did, well, certainly the first major project, was in March this year, which was a, was a catwalk or a fashion parade. And we raised about $50,000 uh, for gastric cancer research through the catwalk for a cause. And, and again, that, that brought in about 400 people um, to the event, which just provided exposure for our club. Uh, a grocery project in the planning stages at the moment, but essentially what we're doing there is we're being brought into a, a existing business to help design the uh, giving strategy for that business. So while we're actually not really doing much heavy lifting at all, uh, what we are doing is helping them promote, helping them design and helping them market uh, their philanthropic strategy. Um, our first club fundraiser was a, was a raffle, which only just recently got drawn. Uh, essentially what we've done there, what we did there was pull together 20 donations, uh, 20 wine bottles, which were, had an average value of about $100. And we raffled off 240 tickets. And one person uh, received the entire prize, prize and, and tickets were $50 a prize. So we ended up raising just over $10,000 for the club, which will be put towards emergency relief funds and helping um, fund or at least provide seed capital for events like Catwalk for a Cause and others. Now, the final one which is happening in August is the one that I think is probably the most exciting out of all of them. And uh, what we've done there is we've partnered with the Centre for Social Impact and UWA and it's in Young. And uh, we've built a workshop which is designed to teach people the concept of design thinking and we're going to use that, um, I guess, the lecturers are going to teach people this process, but at the same time, use that process to help solve some social challenges that our community faces. So not only, I mean, there's, there's fantastic outcomes um, for running that present or that workshop, but I think for the club, one really great outcome is that we're, by the end of it, we're going to have about 14 different project ideas that really think differently about some of the causes that we all feel uh, really strongly about and want to help and make a difference too. So that, that's coming up in a couple of weeks, but I understand that that's nearly sold out as it is now. <clears throat> There's just a couple of photos. So Catwalk for a Cause, the fashion show. Um, this was the group of members that went to Catwalk for a Cause, all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. And I think you can get a real flavour for who our membership is um, by looking at this photo. 
so the John Curtin weekend and the Ripen, um, the, the leadership courses, you know, this is great for our uh, members to be involved because it is hands on, but it's also providing a direct impact to someone immediately. And also doing a meal at Ronald McDonald House and helping out with a more hands on activities um, at places like uh, women's refuges and also Path of Hope. Path of Hope's an interesting one because <clears throat> that's really connected with a club that we have a very close association to, which is the Rotary Club of Perth. And um, what we found is our, our club members have really resonated to this. Um, it, it's, that project in particular is, is trying to break the cycle of domestic violence uh, for women. So we've put together IKEA furniture and, and done different things and um, it's really a collaboration and I think it really sums up what Rotary Elizabeth Key is all about. We don't want to necessarily build or recreate the wheel every time. What we want to do is leverage our time and leverage every unit of effort to provide the greatest impact. So Path of Hope, somebody's already done the, the analysis, the structure, the setting up, and then we can just come in and provide um, help when it's required and provide a real impact that way. So I think the, the key concept there is, while we like to have a couple of our own projects, um, we really want to uh, collaborate with other clubs around um, Perth, predominantly uh, one, because I think it's a really good way to run, but it's also because we always want to have a full pipeline of projects. And for our club to try and do that on our own, um, it would be a full-time job. So a way where we can decrease the workload for everyone in our club is to really collaborate with, a, with other clubs. And the third strategy is fun social events. So we, every month, um, once a month, we try and get, get out of the meeting room and um, go see something different. So we've, we've gone rock climbing, we've had barbecues, we've done whiskey tasting, we've visited the Fringe Festival and a number of different activities. So this comes down to a couple of key lessons. So, so these are the takeaway lessons that um, I'd like to pass on to you. And the first one being that I think it's really important for you to be able to grow your club. Um, it's important that you understand who your niche is or who your, what community you're, you're, um, share, you're trying to serve because what you know you can grow. So we, we have a benefit in, in being really um, targeted at young professionals between um, 25 and 45. And essentially what that means is we can design all of our club activities, our processes, our communication, the way we, our environment to appeal to that demographic. And what tends to happen then is people refer, people like themselves, and we're able to create that opportunity um, to introduce new members. So I think it's really important to actually understand who your members are and who do you want your members to be. The second thing which um, is, has been really noticeable at Elizabeth Key is how professional the structure has been behind the scenes. And I put this down to thinking and acting like a business. So our club has defined strategy and, and has robust and documented processes um, we have strategic plans for each committee and each function, and we really make use of the uh, free tools that, that help with communication and efficiency. One is, I think everybody knows Dropbox, that's just central depository for information and, and files so everyone can use it. But one that um, someone asked me about on Tuesday from another club is called Slack. And through, you know, having been uh, a member of another Rotary Club, there, you really can suffer death, death by email. Slack is, a, is an app which really, I guess, uh, contains the communication that's associated with being a Rotary Club. And you're, you're able to form different channels and have specific discussions. And not everyone, uh, certainly not everyone's a member of every channel. You're only a member of the channel which is actually relevant to you. And uh, it'll pop up like any notification on your phone uh, but that has cut down membership. In fact, it's cut out pretty much all uh, emails. The only emails we get from Rotary now um, 
pretty much are ones that have been forwarded from district or other clubs and it's just easier to forward it on than take it to Slack. This slide gives you a bit of an understanding of our, our process framework in terms of um, swim lanes and, and how we go about it. But in effect, what we want to do is, is build processes and document them so anyone in the club um, can pick up a role and understand how to do that function. And, and this slide's just, just giving you a bit of a taste on what sits behind the scenes in, in every process within the club. Ah, oh, this is critical, um, giving everyone a role. So what we try and do, and, and this was a lesson that I had learned previously at, at my former Rotary Club, is to make sure that you, the turnover um, stays manageable in terms of members, you really got to keep all members engaged. And it's about doing exactly what I've just talked about already in terms of um, events, great speakers, but it's also about giving them, giving people a responsibility where they have a reason to come to the club. So you can see that's our organisational chart. And I think that's almost every, uh, probably not every member, but close to it. In fact, there's even a couple of non-members on there uh, noted by the proposed. Um, so, I mean, and, and there's far more people than that um, sitting under the different um, committees. Now, I'll tell you a fair chunk, at least a, a third of our membership will at some point be within the membership committee. I think the two most important um, functions in the club is the membership committee, which we call the membership um, experience team, <clears throat> and the projects team. And so this outlines the structure of the membership team where we've got focuses on events, but on personal development and just the general membership in terms of onboarding, attraction and retention. So before we finish up, there's a couple of things that I did want to talk about. Um, there's obviously positives and negatives to having um, a niche. And what we're seeing in our club already is that being young and being mobile, people do, um, do move on. And apologies for, for technical issues. Um, I think being targeted to the 25 to 40 or 5 year old, our club turnover is going to be larger than it will for um, other Rotary clubs. But I think also our membership, our membership numbers coming in uh, certainly offset that. It may change as, as we reach 100 um, and then it becomes, you know, a limited resource in terms of being able to, to enter into the club. Uh, but at the moment, you know, our members are um, going overseas, moving into state, and we haven't even, we haven't had a, a pregnancy yet, but uh, that'll happen sooner or later too. And having a young child, I know how hard that is, um, particularly for the mothers. So um, certainly that's one way. Um, and I think it just comes down to um, really knowing who your niche is and, and ro rolling with it. So um, I think the key takeouts, if I, if I can uh, just go back to these, um, really, if, if you're gonna leave with anything today, um, my message to you is really understand your niche, um, who you're serving and what they wanna see in a Rotary Club. Design your Rotary Club so that it's efficient, professional, and um, enhancing your ability to make a difference, not impacting it. And getting everyone involved and giving everyone a role. So in fact, just to cap that off, this is done at the application stage. So we, we make a decision on where someone's going, with their help, um, where they're gonna sit and what committee they'll fall under. And then as quickly as possible, try to begin, give them a specific function, not just a, a, a spot in the committee. So if you're interested in learning more about the club, um, there's a couple of things you could do. You can certainly um, stay in touch by um, connecting in social media. So by liking our Facebook page uh, or following us on LinkedIn, um, by doing that, you'll get an understanding of the work that we're doing, the communications that we're giving. Um, visit our website, uh, www.rotaryeq.org and uh, see how we've designed and how we project ourselves. Now that was designed by a professional website uh, designer pro bono. Um, 
but I think it's a really great example of what a Rotary um, Club website can look like. If you're in Perth, please come along to any of our future meetings um, to get a real taste of how we do what we do. And our next speaker is Professor Lynn Beasley, uh, who's coming on the 2nd of August, which is next Wednesday. We meet at a bar called the Laneway Lounge, and we've got a section at the back of the bar, which is the restaurant area, which we can close off, and, and it also has a stage. And I would fully um, recommend uh, reading this article by Michael Brand about his perception on why uh, service clubs are, are, I think that's a bit misleading because it's not so much about why our service clubs are dying, it's more about how can we make Rotary um, even stronger for the next 20 years, as strong as it was in the last 20 years, um, appreciating the changing in generations. So thank you everybody for um, listening in. Um, I hope you at least had a taster about uh, what we're doing at Rotary Elizabeth Key and what we want to do and how we'd like to engage with people. Please also feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, the, this link will be shared um, in time and uh, the organiser through the Facebook page, which you would have found this, can certainly give you my details, but I would be happy, more than happy to answer any um, specific questions that you might have. So thank you all very much. Thank you, James. And we do have some, some questions here for you. One from Bernie. And the question is, what type of memberships does the club promote? i.e. social, full, active and corporate. So the question is, what sort of different type of membership types do you have? At the moment, it's, uh, and thank you for raising that, Bernie, because uh, it raises a good point, which I forgot to mention, but at the moment we have um, only personal memberships. So we're in the, we're, you've got to appreciate we're still really growing. Um, it's early days. Corporate membership, I think, is something that can be looked at, which is a really great idea for clubs. Um, associate membership, we're not focusing on right now. I think if we, if we got to a point where we're at a hundred members, we may look at it. We do have a segment of the Rotary Club though called, you know, Friends of Rotary. And I mean, that, that's a no cost option, <clears throat> but it doesn't give you, basically it, it restricts your privileges to essentially at, uh, volunteering at certain things which we invite you to volunteer to and coming along to um, guest speaker meetings uh, when, they, when they come out. However, we have done one thing recently, uh, which is, it looks like it's gonna be really successful, but we've, we've advertised for, um, we've, we've formally advertised through seek.com, positions of volunteering uh, for specific functions. So particularly our marketing, which, We've had one marketing, or we've had a couple of marketing people in the team, but they're really, in terms of how much marketing we do um, from a social media point of view, we, we need additional hands on deck. So we've specifically advertised for that role and, uh, and I think of a couple of other roles in terms of, say, a copywriter uh, to produce content. And so far we've got about 25 applications from people who have had some connection with Rotary but aren't members of uh, clubs at the moment. So I think that's been a, uh, that may in turn um, start a new class of membership where someone is engaging with the club just for a specific function. But I kind of think of that like our auditor. You know, we have a, a, an outsourced auditor to an accounting firm and, you know, they'd come, they do their job, they go away, they don't really do much else. So uh, I, I, I think it'll either be, these people who are attracting through Seek and LinkedIn can either be full members or they have the option to just fulfil one particular function. Thank you, James. Uh, we do have another question here from Peter. And the, the question is, what format do you use at meetings? <clears throat> so essentially, um, we grab a drink and try and hustle everyone into the room at 5.30. And pretty much every meeting starts off um, an MC welcoming the, the, uh, the crowd and uh, welcoming specific guests, um, particularly if they're from other Rotary clubs. Um, there will then be um, 
But so we keep it quite light. So the, the president will then be introduced and may give a few updates. There may be a few, uh, so see he's standing at the time. The, everyone else is sitting facing the, the stage except for the president who's facing away from the stage. And he'll give updates. He may introduce people to give specific updates about projects, about other things going on, of um, social events. But essentially, um, total speaking time would probably be 15 minutes. Then a, it depends on what meeting it is. If it's a guest speaker meeting, um, someone will be invited to give an introduction to the guest speaker, and then the guest speaker will talk for 25 minutes then the, that person will then give a vote of thanks and the president will say the final word and will we'll, um, disperse for drinks at the bar. Um, but if it's a projects meeting, um, instead of introducing a guest speaker, we'll then break into our different groups and have um, you know, discussions as a group about how we're moving forward on different project ideas. Thank, thank you, James. We have another question here from Kate. How can we encourage members to refer people who are like them in values, but different in background, e.g. gender, ethnicity, profession, age, etc., with the goal of innovation through diversity? Now, I think diversity is a funny thing because I think our club lacks diversity, not from a gender point of view or a, um, a, a sorry, from a gender point of view or nationalities uh, or ethnicity. I think certainly from an age point of view, we are um, not diverse. So for us, I think it actually comes back to, do we want to be diverse? Um, do we want to have people who are 20 years old and 50 year old, uh, 55 year olds in the club? And, you know, I, I keep coming back to, no, I, you know, I think what we really need to focus on is who we are and what we stand for and who we really appeal to. So if diversity is something in your club that is really important in terms of who you are as a Rotary Club, <clears throat> I think that every member needs to have, I mean, that needs to be a core value of the club. If it's not a core value, then you're not going to really encourage members to do that, to bring in people of a diverse nature. However, if it is your core value, if, you, if your niche is saying, well, we are a diverse club, we have you know, many different um, nationalities, various ages, and in fact, that's our niche, diversity. Then, um, you know, I think it's all about being really clear about that's, that's part of your club values, that's part of your club um, membership attraction strategy. Now, if it comes down to um, how do you get your members to introduce people who are more diverse, which is, I think, the specific question, um, I would ask you a question to say, have you asked your members to try and bring in people who are in their network who are more diverse? But, you know, diversity, it, it just depends because, you know, there are, there are great clubs. I think diversity is a great thing, but I think um, I'm not going to get too hooked up on it because, you know, I'm not so much practising what we preach because we're not diverse from an age perspective. Um, likewise, there's, um, there's clubs around Perth who lack um, gender diversity. Um, and, you know, my view on that is, well, that could be that, that, I mean, on the face value, that looks like a bad thing, but on, you know, if you dig a bit deeper and say, well, perhaps that's a good thing. And, and perhaps there might even be a place for women, you know, a Rotary club with, uh, women only, uh, not by design, but just, you know, um, in the end ending up like that. And I suspect if that was the case, that would be one successful Rotary club. Um, I was just at a... Uh, a business chicks event. Um, it's a it's a like a business uh, group for for females, predominantly females. Um, and they had Amy Cuddy um, speak during the week. And I reckon I was about the you know one in ten males in the room, and there would have been about four hundred females. But there is a real niche um, if someone wants to um, run with that in terms of having a female club. So that's why I don't really beat up the uh, you know some of the other clubs who who don't have many, if at all, any females in the club uh, because I think one day it will swing the other way. So, Kate, I'm not sure if I actually answered your question, but essentially if it came down to it and I had to, in a couple of words, say an answer to that, I would say do your members know that that's the membership you're trying to attract? 
um, and then go about um, creating a club which would appeal to those members. So if you're trying to attract a, a diverse ethnicity, well, you might have someone, you might have a, a refugee or someone who's come from, well, in fact, Akram Azimi is a fantastic example. You know, he was um, a refugee from Afghanistan and ended up coming to Australia, not being able to integrate well initially, but then he became ducks of his school and then ultimately um, a Young Australian of the Year um, and then is now, you know, lecturing at universities and uh, he is just one amazing person. If you wanted a diverse uh, people in your Rotary Club, then you have a speaker like that and then you target different areas to bring in, um, I guess, different ethnicities and, and sell it that way. That, that's probably my starting point. Ah, thank you. Thank you, James. A, a, a question from a different angle from, uh, from Peter. And Peter asks, what has replaced fines? From a, um, I, I assume you're talking about um, club revenue, um, so basically, club. How do you how do you uh, attract club revenue if you're not having the fines? Now, the San Francisco club that I went to, uh, where really we borrowed the idea of, um, they had a thing called um, Happy Moment or something like that. So, and and I've I've read an article recently about another club. Um, I think it might have been a Canadian club where they had a similar thing. And essentially, what they would do is. Um, people would volunteer to, so everyone knew that it was a way to raise money for the club and people would volunteer to mention something happy that's happened in the last week or two um, in their lives and they would pay a donation there. Now, I think that's really a different mindset. It's a real positive mindset. And rather than getting uh, a, few ga a few laughs through fine, but ultimately potentially putting guests and new members and younger members really offside by some of the, the jokes or some of the um, putting people on the spot that fine sometimes do. So they have a thing called happy moments and we haven't introduced that into the club yet, but we may yet, but uh, we are trying to keep our club really low cost. So I don't know how that will go. The, however, they're, they're, it just does mean that we need to fill the gap. And if you think, well, what do we actually need money for? Um, the only thing we really need money for that's not covered by membership fees, I would suggest is helping start projects and, um, and then pro or fundraising for causes. And uh, essentially that's, that's what we do through things like the raffle. So we raise $10,000, that's going to provide in perpetuity um, around about, say, $8,000, which we can use to help set up uh, projects. When the projects are done and the money's raised, well, we pay the club back. So the money's not actually spent, it's just lent. Um, but every year we'll run this raffle and it will grow over time. Um, the extra 2000 will be there for, you know, Rotary Foundation contributions or if there's an earthquake or a cyclone, um, we can write a check out to Shelterbox or something similar. So really that's, um, that's how we raise money for the club. Um, I would say it's more like one-off um, one off effort and, and I think just fundamentally uh, fines just wouldn't fit in our club. Thanks, James. Another question this time from Ian. When starting a new club, the issues are much clearer than changing an older membership historically to a new age rejuvenated club. What approach would you take to do this? In other words, what, what approach would you take to a rejuvenation program? That is an excellent question. And I think if you can solve that problem, uh, you solve all of Rotary's problems because from my observation, <clears throat> it's much, much easier to set up a new club um, than it is to change an existing club. And now I, I don't know the solution, but I, I suspect it's something like this. Um, you've got to understand, um, so to, using some of the framework that I talked about, 
you need a real, you need to actually take an assessment of where you are and where you want to be. And if all of your members are happy with where you are, where you, where you are and, and think that that's where they would like you to stay, I wouldn't even bother trying to change it. Um, you're only going to be able to change a club if, you know, the majority of members um, want to do so and, you know, it fits within the culture and if the members who aren't happy um, or the club's not going to fall over if you lose a few members because they didn't want to change. So, you know, changing a culture in a Rotary Club's, you know, like changing a culture in a business. Um, but I think you, yeah, a good point would be get every, get every, get the core group uh, or, and the majority of the members on board in terms of saying, what do we want the club to look like? And then step it out um, and take baby steps at a time. And if you, um, you know, all of those things which I mentioned in terms of fines, uh, all of those things which doesn't really connect with our, my generation, um, just easy as it goes, um, change it over time. Um, don't try and change it tomorrow. But in the meantime, uh, it depends, you know, what level of the club, whether you've got 20 or whether you've got 60. I think you'd take different approaches. If it's less than 20, um, you know, you, you might, or in fact, even say less than 15, you might seriously consider um, merging with another local club and starting afresh because, that will give you the trigger to be able to implement some of these changes without much resistance. But if people have ownership of their club, particularly, um, you know, I went to a Rotary Club the other day and people have been members for like 40 years, you know, good luck trying to change that culture overnight. You know, that's going to take heavy lifting for a long time if it needs to change at all. Fine. Thanks, James. A very short question here from Ian. Um, will your slides be available? <clears throat> now, this, this is recorded um, and it's going to be distributed by link. Um, Kara, you're probably best to answer that. Is, are you going to also um, publish the slides? Yes, that would be my intention. Okay, so that's a okay yes. That. yes. <laughs> we'll be doing that uh, in early August. Okay, and, and um, so... Will the attendees of this get an email saying that the um, the presentation is ready and the slides are available? Yes. Is that a possibility? They will, yes. Okay. So I think that answers that question. Another a question here from uh, from Samantha, District Rotary Representative Samantha, who's uh, uh, from, from District 9465, who's helping out with District 9455's Rotary Actors as well. So great to have okay. you with us tonight, Sam. Um, the question from Samantha is, thanks for sharing some of your club's ideas with us. As a young person, it is great to see young Rotarians running a club in a different way with so much success. So it's a statement there from, from, uh, from Sam. So uh, commendation from the District Rotary representative, James. Oh, look, thank you, Sam. Um, what we've actually tried to do is build a club that would also um, help engage people, or, sorry, Rotary actors beyond Rotary Act. So when people have realised that they've reached the end of their Rotaract journey, we want a club that um, is a seamless transition. Um, and I, I think that that will work over time. So I'm happy to take that one offline and um, see, see your thoughts uh, further, Sam. Great. Thank, thanks, James. James, looking at social media, uh, which, uh, and, and I note the slide you had on earlier on, which has been the most effective uh, social media platform for Elizabeth Key? Uh, look, I think Facebook certainly, because the ability to get events and pictures um, has been the most effective so far. Uh, and I think probably more effective than our website, to be honest. <clears throat> However, I think if you ask me this question in 12 months' time, I think LinkedIn will be the most um, uh, the best to connect with the members that we're trying to attract. Um, we, we are trying to, you know, not only we're young, but we're also CBD based professionals and they tend to be very active on LinkedIn. So if we can produce really good content and uh, engage with that, I think LinkedIn will actually be uh, a very good um, 
way to go. But I will also say that you need it all. You know, you need your LinkedIn, you need your Facebook, you need a website, a really engaging website. And uh, the Eventbrite helps as well in terms of uh, well, multiple benefits there. All right. Thanks, James. The Looking at this, a, a, a personal question of mine, but obviously we have a number of clubs that do need to, or are in the process of transitioning and others that are just starting that journey. One of the things that, uh, came that rang out loud and clear um, in your presentation was this issue of identifying your niche and making yourself relevant to that niche, which is which really goes beyond a specific demographic or, or age group. It's really about knowing, you know, knowing where your strengths are and uh, really building on those. Would that be correct? Absolutely. If you by by yeah, that's what it does. It narrows the focus. So having a, you know, a, a theme or a niche just allows you to really cut back and you take less of a scattergun approach. So you can really, it's powerful to be able to tailor, you know, everything um, to appeal to a niche if you know who you're serving. So that's what we've been able to do. We've just been able to... Um, you know, if we focus on appealing to one particular group, then um, we can do it really well. And th that said, you know, that might not necessarily, how we do things probably doesn't appeal to 20-year-olds and it most certainly wouldn't appeal to 60-year-olds, but it definitely appeals to, uh, you know, the 25 to 40, 40 45-year-olds. Obviously, from the way it's working so well at the moment, it's a, it's a very well, very well organised uh, Rotary community. Well, it does seem that we've uh, exhausted the, uh, the the supply of questions at the moment. So, uh, um, before we do close, uh, I would just like, on behalf of the audience, to thank you for your efforts tonight, James. A, a, a fantastic presentation, and uh, certainly uh, uh, it's, it's it's ticked a whole lot of boxes. So, so thank you for that. And I uh, will, yeah, a thank a thank you there from uh, from Ian. Um, and I'd also like to thank our audience tonight for, for, for being so engaged, for coming up with some fantastic questions. And uh, uh, just to recap in terms of the availability of tonight's content, we will have the recording available uh, in, in early August and we'll also have uh, uh, James' slides available for downloading. So uh, uh, on that note, I would like to thank you all for being with us tonight and say good night and uh, just, to, just before I do go, just to remind everyone from District 9465 that we do have our major membership and club building seminar, the Network 18 uh, series of seven seminars that are being held next, uh, next Sunday, the 6th of August. And everyone, of course, is very welcome to, uh, uh, to attend the seminar that's most convenient for them. But on that note, good night. <laughs>